Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Asia Tech Podcast live on Twitter, Graham Brown, Michael Waits. What are we going to talk about tonight? I want to talk a little bit about the tour, just some yep. of the preparations that we're making, and then I want to talk a little bit about I want to go back and address something that we addressed before, and that was Bitcoin, blockchain, and ICOs, and how ICOs are not just changing the way companies get funded, but also changing the way regulators are starting to look at that funding and maybe what some of the risks are, but also why we're here. In other words, why do, why is this happening? Why are ICOs kind of moving or moving the market the way they are? But first of all, let's talk about tours. So I'm in Bangkok, right? So it's up to me to figure out what we're going to do when you come to Bangkok and who we're going to meet and how we're going to do it. We have yep. choices, right, from – Essentially, what we want to do in each city, I think, is kind of base ourselves around a very high-level co-working space, try to meet people there in and around that space in that city, try to figure out what the vibe is in that city, and use that co-working space as a base. And what I did today was I went and I talked to the founder of Launchpad, a guy named Vincent Setiwan, a really hardworking, just sort of head, head to the, you know, nose to the grindstone kind of guy. And spend some time talking to him. So we've kind of worked that out. And, you know, we've put in a tentative date. I believe it's interview him on September 25, go to the co-working space and broadcast on Sep 26, and then kind of wrap things up on Sep 27. But that's about six weeks away. So we should have enough time to plan that and do that perfectly, kind of regardless of what the schedule in the middle of. But I just wanted to kind of let you know, let everybody else know that that's kind of where things are going. Very exciting. Yeah, and he's super and it dovetails nicely because, you know, we talk a lot about how each one of these cities sort of has their own vibe um, and their own sort of growth trajectory. And one of the things that Vincent has decided about Launchpad, we were talking about it today, um, is some of the other co-working spaces are trying to build multiple um, outlets in every city. Not only that, but in other cities as well. Mm-hmm. And I believe Vincent and Launchpad will do the same thing. But his idea is if he's going to expand, why not expand in the same building so he gets economies of scale? In other words, there'll be, there'll be one reception area, but the, the next floor where he's going to build, and he's actually already built most of it, is going to be slightly bigger offices. It's more like less for startups per se and more just for businesses that need office space that's kind of related to the tech and startup scene. But maybe those businesses are a little bit more mature. And if you look at the space – it feels like a more mature space than a normal hmm. um, co-working space. But again, it's based on the same thing. You want to be here for three months. You want to do it on a month-by-month basis. But you get all the benefits of the you know, of the maid service and all the other stuff that goes along with being in a co-working space, but maybe slightly bigger, more sophisticated meeting rooms. And then you can use the sort of downstairs space if you want to bring clients in and it feels more sort of startup-y. So his concept for this is different. And we'll discuss that with him when we talk to him sort of later in September, but that's getting organized and that's getting set too. And, you know, we already know the Fukuoka thing is being worked on. We've been, we're working on Singapore too. We should have that nailed down over the next couple of weeks too. We'll be able to announce when we're going to be there and who we're going to be working with because that should be wrapped up by the end of this week too. Jakarta as well. I just got off the phone with the guys in Jakarta. Tell me. Kajora. Yeah, Kajora. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Tell me, tell me. You know, you said September the 26th. Well, they invited us to Jakarta on September the 26th. That's okay, because we're flexible in Bangkok, right? Right, right, right. So yeah, no there's a problem. big event. There's the, the Dijimbic event in Jakarta on September the 26th. It's probably the biggest sort of start event in Jakarta is for it? the year, right? Sorry. What's the event? GMIC. G-M-I-C. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but I said we probably won't be there because we're going to be in Bangkok at that time. But hey, we're going to be there around about that week or maybe the week after, so... Yep, either way is fine with me because yeah. the guys that I'm working with here are very flexible. I told them we may need to be flexy on dates, so we'll make a decision, but it's, it's one or the other, right? So that's now we have Fukuoka set, we have Jakarta, Bangkok, and Singapore, and now we're just working on Yangon and Ho Chi Minh. I think Ho Chi Minh I can take care of pretty quickly as well, and then it's just Yangon to get fixed. So anybody out there who's listening, oh, Hong Kong too, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Hong Kong, I think right. we can do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that should be easy. Anybody out there who's from Yangon who wants to help us set up there, you know, DM me. I'd love to be able to find like the right co-working space, and even if it's not a co-working space, just some space there to be able to do this properly. Let's tell them what the deal is, so they get an understanding of what we want to do there. Because go for it. We, we don't just want to go there, and we don't want to go and hire two desks for the day. We want to come and bring no. the Asia 
Tech Podcast Roadshow to your co-working space. Correct. Set up a mini event, bring you the publicity, bring you the startups, you know, bring you the spotlight for those two days and interview your star startups within the co-working space. Maybe the people who run the co-working space get an idea of how they fit into the ecosystem and so on, you know, get an idea of their philosophy, how they differentiate from the other co-working spaces in the city and so on. So that's the deal. That's what we want to do. So anybody in Yangon, where else do we say that we haven't got covered yet? Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, Ho Chi Minh, I'm relatively sure that if we just like talk to the right people, which I've already started to do and press a few buttons, we'll be able to do that. I guess the one thing I want to say before we start talking about um, the blockchain and about ICOs and about Bitcoin as well, and just, you know, sort of cryptocurrencies in general, just readdress that is, you know, you and I are also going to be in Shanghai in September, first yeah. week in September. Yeah. So we've been invited to be one of the key opinion leaders at a really large event there that's being run by Huawei. And that's exciting for us too. So we should be able to get some really good conversations and insights from the tech ecosystem, not just in China, because Huawei is a global company. They spend somewhere between 9 and $10 billion a year mm. on, R- on R&D, and they basically run the entire backbone of the Chinese internet. So their insights into this should be fabulous and just the fact that you and i got invited for the asia tech podcast is awesome we're going to do a live broadcast from shanghai yes we are that's gonna be amazing yes we are love it it's all to come that's asiatechpodcast.com slash tour if you want to find out more details about dates places details about where we're going to be what we're going to be up to go and check us out there but as michael says dm us here at asia tech pod Hashtag Asia Tech Podcast, or you can catch us on Facebook as well. Asia yeah, Tech and, and let's kind of introduce this by saying one of the upcoming interviews that we're going to do on ATP Stories is a guy named Anthony Lewis. I think Anthony yeah. Lewis, excuse me. And Anthony runs something called bitsonblocks.net, and it's really – it's out there really to sort of humanize what's going on and to, you know, to put in layman's terms what's happening in the cryptocurrency and in the blockchain world. And you know, I'm, kind of, I'm using some of that to try to figure out and to try to understand better what's going on in the ICO world. Right? Mm-hmm. We talked about ICOs a few weeks ago. These are initial coin offerings, right? And I'll go through what he says are like the seven characteristics of an ICO bit by bit. But the, one, the reason why I want to talk about this is because – ICOs, um, ICO investments or the raising of ICO money over the past month or two months, let me get my exact, let me get my exact data here, um, is, <laughs> so initial coin offerings have raised $1.2 billion and it now surpasses early stage VC funding and particularly as it relates to any businesses that are getting funded in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. This has now really become the way to raise money. So there's some, and I'd be curious to know your opinion on this too. I have, I have my own opinions as to not just what is happening, but why it's happening. And I'm curious for everybody else's opinions too. So if you're listening, you know, jump in and let us know. Or even if you just have a question, um, you know, I believe that Graham can see what those questions are on, oh, on, yeah, we'll on pick them Twitter up. and on Facebook. Yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. But just yeah. think about the implications of this. Go ahead, Graham. Yeah, Sorry. has there been has there been a startup that's actually done the IC, which is a non blockchain startup that's done an ICO? Has there been yeah, a so, non? Has that happened? Yep, Rather so than just another blockchain startup, you know, that's a bit sort of like uh, echo chamber blockchain startup raising yeah, an ICO, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what's really interesting. So we'll talk about Tezos later because they raised. Um, $200 million in four days. They're not done yet, right? And we talked about this. 200 in four days? $200 million in four days. And I believe, we'll look at Tezos again sort of later, but I don't even think they have a fully formed product. <laughs> so, but let's go back and talk about a company that is, you know, in Thailand where the development shop is in Thailand. Their company is registered in Singapore. You know, they've been funded by some big Japanese companies and this is Omise, right? So Omise essentially runs a payment gateway for startup companies as well. Apparently they've built some really powerful APIs mm-hmm. and they're the first company that I know. I know them, I know the founders personally. I know the business really well. They went out and raised $25 million um, in ICOs and the headline, you know, to give, and this is in TechCrunch, not in some of the local papers here um, is that it says 
they've raised $25 million in an initial coin offering that bucks the money grabbing trend. So the, the implication there is that a lot of the ICOs that have been done are really just out there grabbing money that it seems to be from sort of uninitiated or maybe I wouldn't say uneducated, but sort of unsophisticated um, Bitcoin and Ethereum coin holders who just want to you know, sort of trade them at a discount. Right. What does that mean? So they trade they trade some of their existing coins for Omise Go coins, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then the Omise team, if they want to, and I think they've done this, right? They can then turn that those coins into fiat currency by selling them to other coin holders, and then take that money and invest in their own business. Now, what makes this interesting, and one of the things that I've learned over the past few weeks when I've done more work on this, is besides the fact that. There's a ton of money sloshing around this um, this ecosystem in ICOs, which means that there's just so much interest in raising ICOs and putting money into them, and also in raising capital this way. We saw 1.2 <coughs> billion. <laughs> Don't do it now. Not on me now. We've got a whole string of interviews to do this week. You just swallowed a Bitcoin. I did. I think I swallowed some Ethereum, and that's really worse, <clears throat> which is uh, better than swallowing helium because then I'd sound like a little boy. Right. Okay. So here's what I want to know is that, I mean, the people that are actually investing in ICOs, are these Bitcoin holders per se? I mean, because I imagine, I know you're saying that they're trading them at a discount. So if somebody came in and traded a $4,000 Bitcoin at a discount, even if they were going to trade that at a 50% discount or whatever, they're still making a massive markup on the you know, the Bitcoins that they bought originally, right? So I imagine a lot of these people are people who've made big money in Bitcoin who just want to kind of put some of that back into an ICO, right? Yeah, so basically what's happening is there's a lot of speculation in the issuance of what are essentially new currencies, right? So if you go back to, you know, pick a time in history, 1700s, 1600s, if you formed a new country, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Japan, whatever it was, you would then say, okay, <clears throat> we've got a central bank, we've got some sort of central banking mechanism, we're going to issue a new currency. Mm-hmm. So the issue of these coins, this whole concept of an ICO and cryptocurrency in general, is that you're trying to democratize, so remove from sort of this a central place, a central bank or a central country, the, the ability to issue currencies and create value. So if you think about what money is, right, it's a piece of paper that has an implied or an implicit value. And that money allows you that paper and that value, which everybody agrees on sort of inherently, allows you to transact, whether it's for services or goods or actually to buy other money. And what's essentially happening now is individual companies like Omise and um, EverX and individual companies that are doing this along with some funds are now issuing their own Bitcoins or ETH coins. And they're saying, it's our currency. We're going to use it partially so you can transact inside of our ecosystem, but also it's going to make it fungible and tradable. And that word fungible and tradable is actually really important. So that then you can buy other goods and services with that coin, or it's just a store of value, right? And if you think about, so let's, let's talk about this $25 million, excuse me, um, issuance that Omise did, what was it, in June or July? I can't remember. They issued $25 million of coins. And if you go to a website called coinmarketcap.com, it's almost like a, um, it's like the day-to-day, but it's actually live, kind of the Wall Street Journal stock page, but just for what the value is, the market cap is, if you don't understand what that is, it's like, what is the outstanding number of coins? What's the value of each one of those individual coins? And then what's the sum <clears throat> total? So again, really simple math, outstanding coins, price per coin, total market capitalization. And I don't think most people would know this, but Bitcoin, obviously by far the biggest, the closing market cap or the current market cap for Bitcoin is 68, almost $69 billion of Bitcoins exist in the world. And if you look at the chart, so it's gone down a little bit over the last day or so, but if you look at the chart of its um, ascent, it's done nothing I think this is over the day, but if you look at it over the last few months, it's like in the last couple of days, it went up 35 or 40 percent in value, right? So it's been kind of insane. The second biggest is $27 billion. That's Ethereum. And then Ripple, which was one of the first companies in the United States, but just globally, right? Because it doesn't matter so much, issued their own coins, XRPs, and that's worth $6.3 billion of market cap. So let's back up again. 
and let's say, you know, the Omise team issued $25 million in, in coins, let's call it 20, $25 million in coins, right? And they most likely exchanged some of those coins with some of their investors into cash so they could then go out and build more products, build out their payment system, get more clients, do marketing. But the beauty is that they didn't sell any equity. Mm. This is one of the reasons why these ICOs, and there are multiple reasons why they're happening now with incredible frequency over the last month or two, and that is you can raise money to build your company. It's obviously better if it's a, a blockchain or a, a cryptocurrency company, but Omise is not necessarily. They do payments, so peripherally they are involved, and we'll talk later if we can find out some companies that, ha- that aren't related to the blockchain per se, but that have issued currencies. So, they issue 20. Let me, Go ahead. let me understand. So I'm going to approach this as somebody who, who knows nothing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm almost there, but let me ask the stupid question. So <laughs> when it comes to ICOs, yep. if, as an investor, I'm not buying equity in the company. I'm buying oh. a currency effectively, which is issued by the company, which Correct. is then tradable into other Bitcoin, right? And, and, fi- and other fiat currencies, right? right? So in the same way that in the same way that if I just come over to you and I say, Graham, here's 100 euros. Well, now you have to make a, now you have to make a decision. Um, you're in Japan. So do you want to turn those euros into yen? Mm-hmm. Are you flying back to Europe for the summer or for the fall to then maybe stay in France for a month? Do you keep those euros to trade? Or do you trade them every day? That's now your grub stake and your ability to trade euros up and down to see if you can make money just by day trading or monthly trading that currency or do you split it up into different currencies so you're not so you're diversifying your risk into different currencies? But think about this. In the 80s and 90s, right, the Brazilian government, the Brazilian real, they, you know, they defaulted on their debt and then they had to reissue their currency. So if you held some of the old reals, right, or reals, those those currencies could have gone to zero. But then they reissued and people said, okay, we now trust the Brazilian government to back this currency better and manage their finances essentially better than they managed their finances before, and hence we're now willing to hold their currency, even though before their bonds went to zero, we kind of got carried out, but now they say it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the cryptocurrency world, there's a window of opportunity now where these companies are, in a way, just to sort of put it into layman's terms, in a way, they're like new countries. Right. They're they're their own Fed Reserve, right? They're issuing the currency... And they're the, the the lender of the last resort, right? With that currency, aren't they? That's how it works. That pretty if, much. If I'm buying that currency, I'm buying it on the basis that I believe that that currency will always be convertible into some other form of currency, right? There's a accepted trust for that currency, so I believe in this. In a way, is it kind of? I mean, similarly to like a corporate bond in that sense, but I mean, you're not repaying them back. I, I, I'm trying to understand how it works. I mean, how, if, if I was to issue an ICO and issue a currency, how does that, that currency then become convertible into other currencies? You know, how does that mechanism work? So in the old days, if you held dollars or if you held yen or if you held any of the sort of G7 major currencies, the US dollar itself was the most tradable currency in the world, which is the reason why <clears throat> oil prices like a barrel of oil is not priced in Chinese yuan or Japanese yen. It's quoted in dollars, and it's quoted in dollars for everybody globally. And because that is quoted in dollars, in the old days, before Bretton Woods, right, the dollar was then backed by what? Backed by gold, right? So there was a standard for the reason why, like, the dollar had value, because in the end, it was backed by a bunch of gold in Fort Knox and other places, theoretically, right? We went off the gold standard, and then what happened was there's just there's an implied value in what people are willing to use that currency for and how much value that they associate it with. Right? So think, again, let's go back to the currency, I mean, the, the country metaphor. Right? So you saw all of Eastern Europe has been reorganized in the past 20 years, and each one of those countries, to the extent that they're not part of the euro, issue their own currencies. And you'll hold that currency if you want to go to that country and buy things. Right? So it uses their ecosystem. So if you think of this goods and services that a company will offer today. Think about it like trying to buy a car, you know, from a country in Central or Eastern Europe. You need their currency to do it. So if you're holding dollars or yen or won or British pounds or euros, you go to that country, you exchange it for that currency, you buy things. And if you have residual, you can continue to hold it. If you have faith in that country on a macro basis, 
And if not, you exchange it back into your own currency and you walk away happy because you have the goods and services that you want. And your Bitcoin and your Ethereum, so most of these most of these new coins are quoted in what their value is in Bitcoins because that's the one with – think about it. You're making the same decision as you would with the currency. In the world, what's the currency with – what's the biggest economy? It's the United States. What's the currency with the most liquidity? In other words, the easiest one to exchange dollar. is dollar, U.S. dollars. So mm -hmm. if you want to buy oil, you can actually buy it in dollars even though – most of the oil in the world comes from non-dollar-based countries. But they're willing to take your dollars for their goods because it's easily convertible into their own currencies but also into other currencies. And I think what's happening is the same thing in the coin market, right? So you're seeing bitcoins or Ethereum, Ripple, and other cryptocurrencies being quoted in bitcoin and Bitcoin, in the end, because there's really no other choice, is not getting quoted in, you know, how many, how much gold it's worth, but it's in how much dollars it's worth. Mm. Okay, so it's kind of coming full circle. But why is this happening? Well, bit, the Bitcoin teams, right, and it's no individual person in Ethereum in the same way. So Ethereum basically said the Bitcoin technology or the blockchain technology on which Bitcoin lives you know, was not built to handle this amount of liquidity and this amount of trading. The block size, I don't want to get too technical into the weeds, but the block size wasn't necessarily big enough, which meant that the more and more transactions you have, unlike in most sort of transactional models, the more expensive it became to transact in Bitcoin. And that gets back to the way Bitcoins and the blockchains are managed through something that's called Bitcoin miners. And those miners to do it, so to be able to verify any transaction in the Bitcoin universe and on the blockchain, it requires an intense amount of processing power. And let's go right to the base of it, right to the core. How do you manage all that processing power? What's the key part of it? It's not just the microchips that run it. It's actually the energy and power it takes to run the computers cool off the processors and just the space that you need to rent to run enough um, computing power to be able to be the first person to verify a transaction in the blockchain. And by doing that, you earn coins, right? So that's how the Bitcoins are mined. Anyway, you fast forward to today and on this page, it's called coinmarketcap.com. They have at least, oh my God, it's 50, 100. I'm just paging down at least 100 cryptocurrencies and let's just go back and talk about the Omise coin, right? So we said that, excuse me, that the full value, the market cap of Bitcoin is 68.8, .8, almost $69 billion. It's the same the as theory, PayPal, right? Yeah, I mean, it's huge, right? And Ethereum is $27 billion. Ripple is 6.3. And remember, <laughs> I think you better sit down for this. And if you're listening, please definitely sit down and pick up your gin and tonic because the Omise, did you look at this yet, Graham? No, what is it? So what do, you think, what, do you, what do you think the market value is of, of, the, of the Omise Go coins that were issued, I don't know, a month or two ago? Right. $25 million in coins. What right, do you so think they, it is? They, the initial issue was $25 million? Yeah, what's, what's the market value for that today? What's the market cap for that today? No, what do you think? Well, no idea no, though, no, right? It's got to be at least double. Double? Okay. It's worth – the market cap of the Omise Go coins is $626 million. So how how is that possible? How how did it go from twenty five to six hundred million? Because the, the without the Bitcoin price going up, because the the conversion rate between Bitcoin and Amisa coins has obviously changed, right? But on what right, basis so they're, co it... they're collapsing? In other words, the relationship between the Omise Go coins and the Bitcoins. So in the old days, if it, if you needed, um, I want to get this right, right? So if it was ten Omise goes to one Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it's now collapsed to a much tighter spread. So you just need fewer of them. And the reason why is because the Omise team or whoever was the owner of these coins that got issued has done a really good job of creating liquidity. This is key. If you think about it like you think about a stock trade, right? You have, you know, you have your large cap stocks, right? Your Coca-Colas, your General Electrics, your IBMs, your Apple computers, your Googles. These are hugely liquid, massive market cap stocks. And then you have your middle market, you know, cap stocks, right? Your mid-market cap stocks, which are, you know, half the value of them, which means that trading in them 
is less liquid, which means that the float is smaller, mm-hmm. and it also means your ability to buy and sell within a tight price range is is harder. Yeah. And then you have you know micro market cap stocks where the liquidity is really poor, and the amount of stock that trades on a daily basis is so small as to make these stocks really what we say is illiquid. Which means that if you want to accumulate any amount of them, it's going to take you maybe days or months to accumulate the same amount of stock, even if it's possible that it would to accumulate. You know, like you can buy, if you go onto the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and you want to buy $100 million of HSBC stock, you can literally just lift the offer and there's probably $100 million of stock available there. You're just done. So it's very liquid. But then you go down to a company that I used to own a bit of. It was called Liquid Metal. It traded, you know, not the pink sheets, but it trades, you know, under a dollar a share. You could never buy a hundred million dollars of stock, first of all, because it didn't issue it, the value of the company wasn't worth a hundred million. But it just didn't trade that much every day because there weren't that many holders of the stock. So the same thing. What the Omise team has done really well is they have really good distribution for their coins and the people that own it. Traded a lot. So yesterday the value, or today the value went down 4%, but it also traded about $80 million in value worth of stock. And that is you know, kind of in line with what their market cap is. So out of their market cap, it's $600 million. It traded $80 million. So about 12% of their, not stock, but value traded today. Mm. That's, very, that's very liquid, actually. Okay, so what's happening is you're seeing companies that – you know, go to a venture capital company and it takes like months to convince them whether they want to take the risk or not. If they have existing shareholders, right, if they issue more stock, so they actually take a venture capital investment or they just take any external investment where they're actually selling new stock, they're going to get diluted. And I think anybody who's listening to this podcast will know what dilution means, right? But if you issue more of something, the value or the percentage ownership for the existing issued stock goes lower. If in all things being equal, right, and actually not even all things being equal, just mathematically it's true, right? So if there are 100 things and you own 10% of them, right, you own 10 of those things. But if I issue another 50 shares, now there are 150 shares out there, you still own 10 of them, but your percentage ownership has now gone down by whatever the increase in the number of those shares are, right? So when – when startup companies issue new stock or get new investors in every round of investment, the existing shareholders, if they do nothing else, will get diluted. Okay, and also you have to convince people to take risk on your sh- on your business and on your shares alone. Okay, and that takes time and that takes energy and you know maybe people don't understand your business and it also means that the people that are investing in your company are most likely. I would say proximate to you, if that makes sense. They're close enough to you so they can maybe come visit your office or fly to your office in two or three hours, right? So, you know, the VCs in the United States, whether they're in California or New York, say their best investments are the one that are are the ones that are within a hundred miles of their office. So fast forward to this past month, and you know, you see companies that like Tezos, right? It's a blockchain company. You've never heard of this company. They raised money through an ICO of $200 million in four days. Hmm. Okay? And so Tezos is another company like Ethereum, but their ICO is not based on Ethereum. It's based on a brand new blockchain. So they did the same thing that the Ethereum team did was they built their entire they built an entire new blockchain, which is fair enough, right? In the same way to make it sort of simplified for a layperson. You know, in the same way there's like Domino's and Papa John's are just two separate pizza chains, no pun intended. You can have different blockchains depending on, you know, who the miners are in each one of those ecosystems. But Tezos has gone out and done this, and they're going to then use their tokens or their coins to go out and build their own ecosystem, but then also to invest in companies that will build on the, on their, on the back of their system as well. So let me understand a bit, Michael, here. If okay. Omise or Tezos was to ICO, raise the capital. I mean, in traditional sense, whether they did an IPO or whether they went to a venture capitalist and raised the, the capital, they would have hard cash or at least a, a note which and that allows them to you know, convert that into cash. To what extent is that the same with an ICO? Did, 
you know, they're obviously trading that in their currency in for bitcoins. Are they then able to then go and convert that into cash? Because they need yeah. that cash to obviously expand and work the capital and so on. What's the situation there? Is it is it directly convertible? You say two hundred million. Is that two hundred million dollars in the bank? Um, it can be, yeah. So essentially, the company who raises that value has to make multiple decisions. One of those decisions is how much of the coin do we want to keep for ourselves, right? So let's imagine a scenario where the team at Omise said we're issuing twenty five million dollars worth of coins, and we're keeping ten percent of those coins for ourselves, right? So we'll sell. As part of the offering, we're going to create $25 million of Omise Go coins, right? Those tokens. We'll sell 90, let's call it 90% of them to the market. That market then takes either existing coins or dollars, or some fiat currency, pays us for them. They get no equity, but they own our coins. Right, so they can buy our coin with fiat currency, not just Bitcoin. Yep, and then we take that money and we say, okay, we want to build better APIs. We want to build more of an ecosystem. We want to invest in companies, let's say, that are going to use the Omise backend payment APIs to grow their businesses. So it's a slightly self-interested investment into companies that will grow. And as those companies grow, they'll use the Omise payment gateway to grow their company. And anytime that company grows, if more payments go through the Omise system, then it's really circular, right? When we say itself, then increases its own market value for its existing stock. But the value of their coins also increases as people have more confidence in the fact that not only is the company going to flourish, but that the token that's associated with transactions in its ecosystem will also flourish. Right? So if it works, it's a virtuous circle. To be fair, though, if it doesn't work, you know, there was a time where you didn't want to necessarily hold a Mexican peso or a Brazilian real or a Greek drachma or whatever it was called or the Italian lira because you just weren't confident mm. – that it was going to maintain its value. So it's the same It's the same type of thing. But imagine if, and I don't know what they did, but just picking a company like Omise because we've been talking about it, imagine if they took 90% of those coins and issued them to other cryptocurrency holders or other dollar holders, right? Um, and they kept 10% of them for themselves. Mm. Well, what's the value of 10% of the coins that they issued? It's like $60 million. Exactly. Because that's 10%. So they'll never have to raise money again. And it would actually mean that the value of the coins that they issued is probably higher than the value of the company. So you're seeing this. But let's, let's again back up for a second and say, if I want to issue shares in a company, I have a company that's registered in Singapore and probably regulated by the MAS or the Monetary Authority of Singapore. If I have a Delaware um, registered corporation, and I want to issue shares in that company at some level. It's regulated by the SEC or by the regulators in the United States, so that when I do get ready to go to IPO, then there's maybe it's regulated by Sarbanes Oxley and all these other existing regulations. But if I do an ICO, which is based on a cryptocurrency and a new currency that I'm creating with new tokens, who regulates it? Nothing. Market. Nothing at all. But isn't that the whole thing with the right. with the cryptocurrencies is that it's based on a distributed ledger technology, which is owned and managed by nobody and everybody at the same time. Mm. And it's a way now for um, companies to raise money, people to move currencies. So like you run the risk of, you know, money laundering and a whole bunch of other problems because the currency itself is not trackable. It's not um, regulated by anybody. But the reality is that as long as there's liquidity there and you can raise that money today, I think there's a small window left. Maybe it's three, four, six months left where these things are just completely unregulated. And I think that's why there's been so much money raised on it. And remember, for existing investors and for newer companies right, that have not done a Series A or even a seed round, if you can do an ICO – Instead of raising $150,000 or $200,000 to get to a seed round so you can then get to a venture round in a Series A, you may be able to convince people. Remember, there's a, there's a kind of a three-step process here, right? And let's look, at, let's look at a company that's in the process of doing this right now. So Everex is a company, I believe, that's incorporated in Hong Kong. Right? So if you look at everex.io and you go to their homepage, there's one day left in their coin offering. 
Okay. It, no, that's not true. It ends the the coin sale is the coin sale, excuse me, is live and it ends on August thirty first. And I'm just trying to see what they've raised so far. But when I checked on it this morning, they'd raised about twelve million dollars. Okay, and they, I believe they were about halfway done. So I think they were raising a total of twenty five million dollars. And what's interesting about these coin sales is that um, it's almost like it almost works in the same way that buying a ticket for one of these big tech conferences work, right? If you buy it early, let's I'm just making up numbers, right? You pay ten dollars for one of their coins. Right. You get and the early longer bird discount. You wait, yeah, you get the early bird discount. And the longer you wait, the closer you get to sort of the final close, the more expensive it gets. But the accumulated value is a certain number of Ethereum coins, which then can get transferred into dollars and lets a company like Everex do two things, I'm guessing, right? One is they maintain some of those coins themselves so they can eat, they can benefit from the increase in value if they can create the right level of liquidity. And two is they invest in their own business and their own APIs and their own um, infrastructures. So they can create a business around their own business and they can use some of those coins, like I said, to seed other companies that will use their tokens to pay to use their services then back on Everex to grow their own ecosystem. And again, it's like a country, right? You put your automotive factory in my country. You need my currency to do that. You pay for my workers. You pay for workers in my country with that currency, and it feeds off itself. And I think there are a bunch of companies out there that are that want to do this, and that's how they're building these businesses around their own cryptocurrencies. In most cases, they're um, they're based on Ethereum. So the, I guess this is the question that listeners want to know the answer to, and I'll I'll ask the question for them: Is that Asia Tech Podcast, we haven't raised a Series A, but let's say we want to go out and raise a million dollars. I thought about it. What do you think? I mean, you know, I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast now saying, that's exactly, that's us, right? You know, let's screw going to institutional investors, screw going to seed round. Let's have a look at this. What's the, why isn't everybody doing it? Is it just a knowledge thing? Is it just like people don't know that it's an option? What? What's stopping people or everybody piling in on this? Well, I think it's a combination of all those things, right? So first of all, you have to be – there are three There are three large components of it, and it breaks down into sort of seven individual characteristics of what an, of what an ICO is. Let's talk about the big three, and then we can run through those seven, right? And it's not trivial, so it's non-trivial. And I think most people will say, you know, just like everything else, everyone says, I want to scuba dive. But then they realize they've got to go 10 meters underwater. They've got to learn how to take their mask off. They've got to learn how to buddy breathe, right? They've got to run the risk of dying. Like all these things get in people's way. And that's why everybody doesn't scuba dive, even though it's an amazing thing to do, right? And, you know, think about triathlons, running, biking, swimming. It's non-trivial. It's super cool to do and it's available for everybody. But all the training that's associated with it means that most people drop out, even if they aspire to do it because it's just really hard. Okay, so an ICO is the same thing. First of all, you've got to have some back-end technology so people can actually transact in those coins. You've got to be able to either build that tech or buy that tech. Okay, so you want to create your own virtual wallet that holds those coins, and everyone who owns your coins has to be able to interact and transact in there. Two is you've got to be able to know how to market it globally, right, because you want every cryptocurrency holder or every cryptocurrency currency interested person or entity to be able to, to be aware that you're actually issuing it. So you've got to be able to market it properly. And the third thing is you've got to create a legal structure around it. And, you know, creating that legal structure takes a certain amount of expertise, which means that the number of people that are doing it are limited and they're, they're distributed over the world. So just to find one in your region or your locality is hard and it's expensive. Right, so to do your own coin offering could cost you anywhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and if you haven't raised money, it's a chicken and egg thing as well, right? So then, my question has been, how do you go out and convince people? Let's say you have an idea for a company that you want to sit on a blockchain. I didn't say the blockchain, but a blockchain, right? Whether it's Ethereum, Everex's, you know, thing, or what, what that company that we talked about, Tezos, who's building their own blockchain as well, right? Their own ecosystem. So if you have a strong legal team that understands how to create the proper legal infrastructure around it, you don't pay them until you succeed. So you negotiate that. 
The second thing you do is you say to your marketing team to rebuild your website, write the white paper that explains, and this is one of the things you have to do, write the white paper that explains not just what your business is, but how the blockchain and your cryptocurrency is going to impact and also how you're going to create liquidity and interest in, in your cryptocurrency. Right? And the third thing is creating the technology behind it. But if you can go to those three teams or if you can build that team yourself and just say to everybody, how much confidence do you have in your ability to do this? Will you work on spec? Right? In other words, it's like hiring a lawyer on retainer where you pay them $800 an hour or just saying, look, that person – you know, ran me over and because they ran me over and broke both of my legs, I can no longer play football in the Premier League. I want to sue them for $100 million. Will you work on a 10% contingency? Right? So if you can get that team together, you've got to find the right team, but they've got to believe in your in two things. One, in your ability to run the business you say you're going to run that's credible. And two, that as a team that they can handle all three of those major components to be able to raise your $25, $30, $50 million. Because if they can, and they're willing to take payment in coin, think about it. If you raise $25 million for Omise, right, and you take a 5% really in, in the real market, it's a 3% success fee at, at its height, right? So if you take, let's do some simple mathematics, 3% of $25 million bucks is a $750,000 fee, and then you're done. Right, So if you go out, you help them raise money, you take a fee, you're done. Now, maybe you take some of that in stock in their company, but that's a five-year – we talked about this when we talked about exits, right? Mm. That's, a, that's a five-year plan for you to actually monetize that at any level. But if you take none of this and you have a $750,000 fee, but you don't take it in dollars, you take it in the coins that they offer, if you had done that for the Omise coins, <clears throat> right – well, let's just say what is 660, right, divided by 25 is 26. So if you did that, instead of taking your $750,000 in cash where you took it in coins, that would be worth almost 20 million bucks. So if you can find people that would do that for you. Well, there's going to be no shortage. Convince- just, I mean, when you talk well, about, I mean, this, is, this, this whole thing is going to become professionalized, isn't it? You know, are we just talking about uh, an industry which would have been, I don't know, what was the IPO industry like? 60, 78, or pre-war, when people went to public offering, I'm sure it was the same, no? where you had to kind of cobble this together. Now, there's a whole system for this, right? You can outsource Correct. this stuff, right? Are we there? Correct. Is it the same sort of process? We're getting there, and I think this was the point that I was going to make, and that is that everything moves so much faster, right? I mean, I don't want to go back and say it moves at internet speed because it makes it sound like we're in the 1990s, and I'm, you know, I'm Jim Barksdale, and I'm talking about Netscape, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think only you and I will laugh at that. But you know what I mean. But I do think things are happening much faster than they would. But so, the, again, in the old days, let's talk about the United States, right, where Wall Street kind of grew up around the idea that you wanted to make the, the implementation and the use of capital more efficient. And by doing so, you had companies that were you know, either based in New York or anywhere in the United States that could then go issue money to the public market to grow their businesses. And to be able to do that took great expertise from a legal, financial, and the same thing, just the tech was different from a technical perspective. And what you would do back then is you'd hire Morgan Stanley or you'd hire Salman Brothers or you'd hire Mer- Merrill Lynch to go and do that IPO for you. And in the old days, you'd pay them 5%, 7% to do that IPO. And when the IPO was done and all the stock was placed, they would get a fee. And that fee would be worth 7% of what it was. Now, in some cases, as the market developed, they would take stock. Right? So there's, I think it's called a green shoe. I don't remember. And that would be sort of extra stock you could issue if it was oversubscribed. And in some cases, depending on what the regulations are at any particular point in time, the firms themselves could have, in the old days, all these laws have changed, right? Have their own sort of proprietary trading desk, buy some of that stock as soon as it's issued not just to hope they would go up, but also to stabilize the price of the stock so it wouldn't go down. Mm. So fast forward to today, and if that's actually possible in the ICO market, imagine being able to buy dollars, right, as soon as they were issued back in the 1700s as the U.S. formed. Now, sure, in the middle of the formation of the country, you know, before J.P. Morgan bailed out the U.S. because the Federal Reserve bungled sort of 
how to keep the, the value of the currency in the United States. And that's a much longer story. But historically, JP Morgan was brought in to say, dude, the country's running out of money. We're going to go bankrupt. Please save the Bank of the United States of America. Um, and did do that. But if at that point in time you could buy that currency, you would have a lot of money now. And I think that's the way people are looking at these ICOs is that you are basically at the beginning of a dawn of the issuance of new currencies. And it, it gets back to this whole concept of you're democratizing finance in a way that's not just local and regional like it was in the United States and Wall Street, but it's global. It's de- completely decentralized. And it all sits on a blockchain. And I think this is where people are finding this really interesting. But having said that, um, in the same way that things were getting regulated on a regional basis or on a local basis back in the day, you know, with every country having their own sort of Securities and Exchange Commission, their own central banks, I think what's starting to happen now is some of these central banks, whether it's the MAS, the HKMA, the Bank of Japan, you know, the Fed and all this stuff in the SEC, are starting to get together. And saying, you know, within two, in 2017, there have already been 92 ICOs. We already talked about it. They're worth about $1.25 billion in the past two months alone. Mm. Okay, just think about that. Okay, and that's way, we t- said it at the beginning of the broadcast, but we'll say it again. It's way ahead of whatever sort of money is getting raised in the venture capital markets for the same stage of companies. But I think the reason why people are rushing to do this is because there's the likelihood that they're going to um, they're going to start trying to regulate it. So, but how? I mean, how, how can you I, regulate an ICO? I mean, if they say right, okay, you know, the, if Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, whoever get together and start, the central banks decide they're going to regulate this thing. You just say, okay, right, we can issue an ICO in the Seychelles or in wherever, right? Surely there's no limit on this. It doesn't have to be tied to any particular exchange or any particular geographical area. No, it doesn't. And so one of the articles that I'm reading, right, it's in fintechnews.sg is saying, and I quote, right, because I want to think about this as well, is that the MAS is currently assessing how to regulate the risks that are associated with activities involving digital tokens that don't function only as currencies. There are multiple ways to issue these tokens. Some of them are being issued as securities, and if they're being issued as securities, the regulators feel like, right, so the monetary authorities and the Securities and Exchange Commissions feel like they do have the right to regulate them. They're trying to figure out what the right way is to do it. But the other thing that they can do is, you know, fear is a great regulator as well, right? Mm. So to the extent that people listen to the opinions of some of the large you know, currency boards and some of the regulators, and they say, look, some of these coins are being used to um, launder money or to finance terrorists or you know, because it's all these anonymous transactions, you don't know what's going to happen. But also the fear around – we talked about it earlier. If people lose faith in the ecosystem around which those – coins are being issued they as fast as they went up to like a thousand dollars or whatever it is a coin they go right back down to zero and remember the whole concept of money right and particularly fiat currencies but just any kind of currency is that it's based the value of it is based on people's belief that it actually has value exactly it's the latin word credo again to believe credit correct it comes from right Right. So, you know, we can spend hours and hours talking about this, but I think just based on the conversation that we had a few weeks ago, getting more information, this is one of the things you and I talk about a lot, right? As we learn more, we talk more about it so we can let other people know who don't necessarily have the time or the compunction to go out and learn about this stuff. You know, the more we talk about it, the more people will learn about it. And I think it's really important. So, you know, I don't want to spend a ton more time talking about it, but that's kind of the way I feel about these things right now, right? Is that while it's becoming more and more common over the past few months to issue these ICOs and to raise money this way, and frankly, I've thought about it for us, right? Mm. Well, we're building an ecosystem. There's a window. You know, to the, there is a window for companies like ours to go out and say, you know, we could issue the ATP coin. And build an ecosystem around that coin, whether it sits on Ethereum or Tezos or, or the original blockchain or Bitcoin, right? There are ways that we can do it, and I've thought about it. So I think the fact that you know financial minds globally are trying to figure out how to use these new currencies, and I don't think they're going to go away. And so I was arguing yesterday with somebody who said, sure, 
Bitcoin has all this value, it goes up and up and up, but as it becomes more and more expensive to mine it and to verify the transactions that are on the blockchain, this whole concept of the blockchain may kind of go away as fast as it happened. But I, I don't really believe that. And, then, and let's go back no. to let's go back to this um, the coinmarketcap.com. So the one thing we haven't talked about is IOTA. <laughs> It's number five on the list. It's $2.5 billion. And these are micro coins and they're myotas. So micro iotas are out there. And to be fair, I don't have enough information on this, but I think people should think about what a tangle is and how it's different from a blockchain. And we'll do some more work on that and we'll talk about that too. But in the context of the more electricity and the more processing power that you need in a blockchain that has a limited number of blocks and where the size is restricted, the more and more transactions that take place, the potential is for it to become, at least in the short term, more expensive to verify each one of those transactions. I think over time that's going to get fixed, right? Technology evolves. But you're moving to a point today where some of the transactions on the blockchain are very expensive to, to verify. And people are trying to create new sort of blockchain-style technologies. One of them is a tangle. IOTA is an organization that's gone out and issued these MIOTA coins Right, and again, I need to do more work on this. But just another representation of a cryptocurrency. So you can argue today that a blockchain or Ethereum or any individual cryptocurrency is either vibrant or not vibrant, is going to be alive or not alive. But what you can't argue about, as far as I'm concerned, is whether this whole concept of you know cryptocurrency sounds like something that a pirate issues, but the reality is that it's not. It's just a super technology techno technology way to issue something that stores value. Right, and I think that that's never going to go away. So whether it's Ethereum, Ripple, IOTA, or Omise Go, one of these things is going to be around. And again, in the same way, you know, there are 147 countries in the world, or more, and each one of them has their own currency. But then they consolidate into the euro for the eurozone. However many countries are there, I think the same thing's going to happen in the cryptocurrency world. Is that the the coins are going to start funging, they're going to start collapsing into maybe three or four global cryptocurrencies. And then they're just going to go on their merry way, and that's going to be the way that people store and trade value over time. That's what I think. Do you believe when you look at some of these cryptocurrencies, especially with these ICO valuations, the figures <laughs> you've been throwing around tonight, some of it I listen with disbelief. Yeah, I know you mentioned <laughs> Netscape. I mean, aren't we sort of there? I mean, there's that, that similar yep. kind of feeling, isn't there? There's a detachment yep. from reality, the fundamentals and valuations. I mean, as you said cryptocurrencies are not going to go away in the same way the internet didn't go away after 1997 right. and, and the 2001 dot-com bust it's still here right but yep. those valuations we don't have pet spark you know we don't talk about aol anymore do we we don't talk about netscape do you feel that similar kind of vibe when we talk about icos that we absolutely did way back then absolutely and i always think about this if you go back and read what's his name richard i can't remember his name lewis he wrote a book called The New New Thing, and one of the things that they focused on was this anecdotal story about why Netscape went public when it did. And it was because Jim Barksdale, who was one of the people who funded Netscape, had ordered the largest like single individually owned yacht in the world, and I think he needed he needed a hundred million dollars to pay for it. You and I have joked about this before. Right. So whether it's really true or not, I don't know. But I think the same it's not thing is the truth, right? I mean, it's not far, but he saw a window. Same thing. He's like, oh, my God, I can IPO this thing. No one really cares about the value of it. There's a bit of a bubble going on. And if I issue now, uh, I can buy my yacht. And I think there's a lot of <laughs> yacht buying going on right now in the ICO market, you know, metaphorically, right? And, yeah, and maybe, yeah. actually, maybe actually not just metaphorically, but I think there's a lot of that going on right now. But in the same way that it took a few years for that window to close back in the IPO market of the late 90s, Everything moves faster today, right. and I think the ICO market, you know, to the extent that governments and regulators and whomever can sort of get in the way of this because, you know, there's a lot of scamming going on there. That's just a fact, right? Any, yeah. Anytime there's money sloshing around an ecosystem with no sort of control, there are definitely going to be scam artists out there who, you know, you don't have to raise $100 million bucks to scam people. You could raise six. And for some people, that's a life-changing amount of money, and they'll risk their sort of reputation if they can figure out a way to do it. They get Bitcoins or Ethereum coins or Omise Go coins, and they go out and they just sell them for fiat currencies, and you know, they move to Costa Rica and forget about it, right? Right, right. So yeah, I don't disagree with you. It's possible.
Yeah, I mean, a lot of the valuations are driven as well by the fact that Bitcoin has risen so substantially in the last couple of years. So a lot of yeah. that is simply Bitcoin going back into the system. In the, in the same way we saw similar kind of movements of cash or value in the dot-com days, right? It was simply yeah. just a, a re-churning of the same amount of money. But there was no real value creation in all of that, right? So eventually that comes to a head, doesn't it? That comes to an end. That force yeah, I mean, disappears. Think, yeah, think about it. So like when Instagram was purchased... Was did did they pay? Did Facebook pay a billion dollars in cash, or did they pay a billion dollars in newly issued Facebook stock? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So if if the stock is a proxy for you know Ethereum, even though it's a different market, right? Um, it's kind of the same thing. They could use their stock because it was so highly valued, and this is what happened again during a lot of the consolidation in the '90s in the U.S. during the stock market bubble back then, and that was, hey, my stock is worth so much money. Why don't I go out and buy? That was the whole M&A bubble, right? Where I can go out and buy companies for free <clears throat> using my stock, break those companies into small pieces, sell them, and make and get cash. Right? So is there a bit of that happening in the ICO market today? Probably. Yeah, I think so. But make hay whilst the sun shines if you're in that market. We should get in there. ATP coin. Yeah, think about it. We're going to issue $25 million of coins. To we, need a yard. So, we need a yard. We need a hundred million. Do we need a yard? Do we need a yard? Let's do it. Exactly. I love it. Anyway. Yeah, that's so that, that's kind of the current take on this thing. Yeah, fascinating. You've done such a good job of summarizing it as well. I mean, you really have done a, given us a full one-on-one of ICOs in the two-part series, really. Do you think there's yeah. more? Is there more that you want to talk about in this area? Do you think we're going to be talking about it again in the next couple of months? I do, and that's why. So we had we had spoken about earlier, right? Who is it? Anthony Lewis, right? Who who runs this this thing called BitsOnBlocks.net? We're going to talk to him, you know, later this month probably, and I cannot wait to get his view. Maybe we're wrong today, right? We talk about this a lot, right? We have opinions, but we don't have a monopoly on the right opinion, and sometimes we get our facts wrong, but we 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 try to get the facts right. I think in this case we have most of this right, but I'd love to get his opinion and his view on all this, and maybe we talk to him two or three times when we do our ATP stories on him. Um, and that's something I really look forward to. Yeah. And, I, and I do think you're right. I think in the context of if you, if you look at some of the people to whom we're speaking on ATP stories, what we're really trying to do there, right, is build another ecosystem of experts in certain verticals and in certain um, topics and the idea is to then go back to them in two months and find out what's changed, what's new, what's different, what they've learned, and what's grown and what's died. And I'd love to find out from you know, the gentleman who's building the bits on blocks.net um, website. I think we're going to have an ongoing conversation with him as well. Yeah, and anybody else that are out there listening to our podcast, whether you're listening on iTunes or you're listening through Twitter or on Facebook, catching us on our newsletter. However you are consuming Asia Tech Podcast, we want to know, I mean, if you're involved in ICOs, you're involved in the blockchain, Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever is cryptocurrency, you can tweet us at Asia Tech Pod, which is our normal handle, or you can catch us at Facebook, Asia Tech Podcast, or you can connect with us through our website, asiatechpodcast.com. It's Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Anything more this week, Michael? I know we've had such a busy week. You're probably... As your voice has already shown by breaking out during this, <laughs> it, came, it came back. It did. It came back, but it might be a second wind. Is there more, or we want to give you a break now? No, I just do want to point out the fact that there has been a lot of sort of external interest in this. I think I'm really happy about the fact that we are going to this conference in September, um, and we'll actually be producing some content for both shows there. Right, so we'll interview some people at the Huawei Conf- conference, and we'll also be broadcasting hopefully live from Shanghai when we're there as well for our regular show. And I just really look forward to that. And um, hopefully we can get more and more people involved in listening to it. But also, if there's anybody else out there that, that's interested in sponsoring like a fast-growing podcast, just let us know because uh, we have room for sponsorships as well. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.